And so I think like one important thing is like treat the gap year with like some respect for like you have to structure it and kind of like set things up for success. Otherwise, like it's not going to make your life better automatically. All right. Well, Laura, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this is the first uh, sort of part of our series of back to school question mark. Um, and basically, we've picked up on a lot of people that are questioning whether they should go back to school or take a gap year or something else uh, as COVID hits and all these classes are over Zoom right now. And when I thought about people that could be really helpful for folks to learn from, uh, you were one of the first people I thought of because to me, you've always been incredibly inspirational. And I think that uh, it would be amazing to share that source of inspiration with the rest of the, our community. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Um, just to give a brief intro on Laura. Uh, so she's pretty incredible. Laura is uh, somebody who actually did not go through traditional schooling. Uh, she went and at age 12 uh, was able to get into a lab uh, uh, at UCSF. And then at age 14, she got into MIT, uh, spent some time there. And then she actually dropped out with a Teal Fellowship at age 16. Uh, is which, which is when she started the Longevity Fund. Can you just give us a sort of short pitch on the Longevity Fund and what you're up to there? Yeah, so um, we think this is the first decade that we'll see uh, human longevity um, appreciably impacted by therapeutics um, given in a clinical trial. And our only job is to try and make that happen as quickly and efficiently as possible. What was it like being homeschooled for you? Uh, so I had a fairly non-traditional, even by homeschooling standards, upbringing. Um, my dad is a hilarious character. He, uh, you know, was bopped around a bunch of different schools uh, when he was young and came up with this very specific educational philosophy that you should kind of follow your curiosity, um, probably fall in love with science early. That's a good thing to do. Um, and so he induced a lot of that when I was a kid by speaking about it in just glowing terms, like Faraday was my childhood hero but he didn't make us do anything really so we had books we could learn if we wanted to um and i grew up in this house in new zealand kind of with my brother uh just playing piano learning languages and reading about math and physics um, and wow. it was absolutely lovely we had originally come from the bay area to new zealand when i was five mm -hmm. and i think there had been some talk of moving back at some point which they did but i, I just want to flag that um i think i was extraordinarily lucky like 99 percent of people when their kids said they want to go to you know america from new zealand would not have made that possible um so i think i, I am where i am in large part because of luck and they're probably like 99 percent of kids that didn't have the circumstances um that i think like I, I i'm just interested like how with virtual learning or kind of new opportunities like pioneer for example yep. their options might be different today than they were like a decade ago for, so why MIT out of all the universities that you could go to and why why when you're 16 versus wait a long time, you know, it's uh, you'd been having this great experience in the lab. Uh, what, what do you think it would be? Yeah, so my dad had told me when I was a kid that MIT is where all the smart people went. He was like, there's one place where all the smart people go in the world to learn together and it was MIT. And I had this vision of MIT um, as Hogwarts because um, I'd never gone to school at all, no high school ever. And I'd read a lot about what school is like from Harry Potter books. <laughs> so I thought I'd show up, there'd be like house colors, there'd be like, you know, dormitories that were like Ravenclaw and Gryffindor, and it would be like a fire in the common room with my pals. Um, and so it was very confusing to show up <laughs> in the first day of MIT and be like, okay, this is like summer camp, but weirder. I don't understand what's going on here. <laughs> And in retrospect, I, there's this one visceral moment that was the most depressing for me in college, which I remember I knew this person and we were very close. We were good friends. She's absolutely lovely, um, mm -hmm. but she was a pre-med and she was telling me about how she had this odyssey like journey to go and talk to her TA and she really needed him to like change her grade and how like she was planning to do this and like all this, this kind of scheming around preparing for that. And I remember just thinking like, that's like the most depressing thing I've ever heard in my life. Like how, how could you put that much thought into like a, like a, like what, but what, like, and, and it wasn't even like she was like, should I get this grade or not? It was like, I need a better grade to get my goals done. So it wasn't even like she wanted a better evaluation, like more correct evaluation. She wanted like this number arbitrarily to like get to another place. Wow. Yep. You ever heard like the Moloch kind of concept? That's called. Mm -hmm. But you should explain it for everybody like, else though. It's this idea that um, a lot of people can all, if they work together in the best way, achieve like a wonderful outcome. Mm -hmm. But because of just kind of all these short-term trade-offs where like individually, if you defect, there's like a short-term minor benefit. 
have it, but nobody else defects, but then everyone defects, so it's like actually really bad. Um, then it means that like no one gets the outcome that they really want. And I kind of feel like that in college, where it's kind of like, I'm sure the administrators don't want kids to arbitrarily optimize for these letters that like they don't care about. I'm sure the professors want to teach people who like want to learn. I'm sure the kids want to really learn, but somehow we're in this like, you know, weird situation where people are just trying to get these letters that are like higher. Um, yep. And that, that just feels like very inefficient. <laughs> I guess that's as the aspects of college that are really frustrating. What are the aspects of college that you found that were most valuable for you? Um, I, I think that I remember very viscerally sitting in the physics common room. People just really wanted to be there. They wanted to learn. Like the kids there were excited about doing research and they were much more advanced for their mm -hmm. course, many of them, especially people who hung in like the physics common room like a Saturday night, like let me tell you. Um, I just liked it for people who were much more passionate and I think uh, or, or going to like the physics lectures, I think. So I, I think I just found a major that to me felt like people were passionate about, where like I could talk to people in it and they were there for a reason to learn. Um, yep. And that, that that was relatively inspiring. Like I'd say the one, like the one reason I would have stayed at MIT is to just take more courses like that, or like Max Tegmark hmm. in cosmology. I mean, good God, right? Like you get to learn from the master, but the super exciting subject, like that was very cool. Um, what, yeah. Was there anything that seemed insignificant at the time that like you look back on now and you realize, wow, that actually mattered a ton? Um, I think that I didn't realize how much I wasn't learning and how much the things that I did learn influenced my life. Like I think hmm. college really is uniquely one of the times when you can actually learn deep subjects unless you take specific like focused time for them after. And I think the, the thing that I didn't realize was, um, for example, there are many courses like biochemistry or like mm -hmm. normal chemistry, organic chemistry, where I had great, well, relatively good scores, like kind of did the problems as they were assigned, but learned nothing. And kind of like going back and trying, and at the time I was doing a lot, so it felt like there was a lot being stored, but then just like, that's a whole like semester just wiped clean. Mm -hmm. And so wow. understanding like when you're in it, the difference between really learning something which you have this unique opportunity to do and all this like fake learning that you're doing is like super important. And it's really hard to do. I mean, to me, the best metric is like curiosity. Like if I feel engaged enough to be asking questions while I'm reading something, that's probably a very good sign. If I'm just reading it and regurgitating it. It's probably a pretty bad sign, but just kind of striking like how much you don't remember from undergrad, but like if you were thinking about it and you plan for properly how much you could, right? It's interesting. I think an average course load in college, at least for me, was too much. Mm -hmm. Like at the time I was like, I'm going to be so hardcore. I'm going to do like eight courses. I'm going to like go twice as fast. And it just meant that like I didn't have time to like go crazy about any one of the subjects. But I think for example, if I had just taken Orgo for like one semester, I would have gone so deep in Orgo. Like I would actually remember a bunch of stuff from it that would be useful today. I mean, I've yeah. worked in ben like biotech venture capital, right? Like it is very inefficient mm -hmm. to not have had like a better foundation in organic chemistry. I have to like rebuild that over like the ensuing decade. Focusing on cramming too much is, is definitely not a good thing. Like it means you, I think, retain lots of things that you might be interested in. Yep. So. I had a similar experience, by the way, like the, the semesters where I took uh, a lighter load of like more meaningful classes were the ones where I felt much more engaged and also retained more. So I, I totally yeah. agree with that. Um, some people claim that like getting a college degree is sort of, you know, is sort of this idealistic thing about like developing yourself as a human. I guess, uh, would you agree or disagree with that? Okay. So uh, I think, um, I, there's so many like shells to preface this with in the sense of like both you and I are two fellows, right? And so yes. the moment that we start thinking of college degrees, the immediate reaction to listeners is think, oh, well, this person dropped out and really they spent their entire like rest of their life kind of impinged upon this one thing that they made how much can I believe a statement that they would make about like the validity or not of, of dropping out as a mode of life. So I think I, sometimes I just feel like it's hard to talk about, even my true opinions would be hard for me to believe coming from me, given that context. So with that as a preface, like, I think that like genuinely um, today, so I, I can actually speak about it, not just from my life, but like the point of a, an, an employer, right? What I look for in a person that I might like mm -hmm. take on board. I think to me today, um, and, and a friend put this very well, uh, like an Ivy League degree is, somewhat of a counter signal in an interesting way. So hmm. I think the most smart people that I know probably have all gone to Ivy League colleges at some point or another, whether they finished or not, but that's been part of their path. But the people that apply for jobs with me that aren't already doing something that they've started independently or kind of like so far outside of my status career that it's not even possible to like, you know, chat with them. Those people tend to be worse, I think, than people that I would meet either at less brand name schools who nonetheless huh. are still reaching out to me or just like coming up like in some independent path. I am much more attracted to someone who is hungry and ambitious, who has 
come, not come from like one of these schools, just given my experience so far than, mm -hmm. than from them. And I, that, that to be honest, and like when we first started recruiting for positions was the opposite. Like I thought, oh, maybe like these are a good filter. And I think my current perspective is like, they're actually kind of not. Um, and that's yep. surprising to me. Like I wouldn't have expected that. Well, so what made you decide to drop out and take the Teal Fellowship? I, so I heard about the Teal Fellowship and my grad student mentor, Adrian Sosarczak, who's still one of the smartest people I've ever met. I don't answer my emails anymore, Adrian, gosh. Um, and uh, it was I just respected him more than anyone that I knew. He said I should do it. And huh. I was like, if Adrian, who is a hardcore academic, is telling me that I should do this, like, I'm just gonna apply and like do whatever I can to get in. I was actually an alternate that year was going to be to, to go to, I think Cambridge in the, oh, the okay. UK to study. Um, Cause I just wanted to get out of MIT. I didn't like it. I didn't mm -hmm. feel like it was a good environment anymore. Um, and I think a lot of people experience this like sophomore slump or two years into college, you're past mm -hmm. the freshman hyped kind of like very memorable first semester. You've gone through a lot of like the bonding and unbonding and like all the stuff that happened in the first two years. And in sophomore year, you're just like, what is really going on here? Like, why am I here? What's the point of all this? Like kind of like an existential crisis almost. Yeah, and so I I think the same thing happened sophomore year. <laughs> <laughs> what is the meaning of I mean, anything? I, but I, I think the funny thing is like everyone who is experiencing that is like, oh, I'm so unique. Like what's wrong with me? And it's like, literally do everyone around you in sophomore year is going through the exact same thing, especially if they're interesting. Don't worry. Like, What are your recommendations, especially in this context of, you know, you can't go to your classes in person. You're learning your over Zoom. The social dynamic of yeah. college is there. Like no one can hang out in the physics lab right now. Um, so how do you kind of think about the pluses and minuses and trade-offs of taking a gap year right now or dropping out? So I, I think the one important thing you have to recognize is that it's like psychologically hard to do this. Like you shouldn't be like, oh, a gap year, I guess like all my psychological and like social problems will just be solved because I'm not in the environment that I wasn't anymore. Like I think one thing a lot of people experience is like they leave college, they're like, oh great, like big adventure. And they show up at like an empty house by themselves for weeks on end. They're like, okay, this actually still sucks. I'm still hanging out with like my own mind. Like what's going on here? And so I think like one important thing is like treat the gap year with like some respect for like you have to structure it and kind of like set things up for success. Otherwise, mm -hmm. like it's not going to make your life better automatically. Right. Like I think it will actually if you take like two or three years, I think a year is about enough time to like get really depressed and slow and then just like stay there if you are not careful. So I, I, I would try and just do a crazy thing of like get a house together with like people that are your age and go on crazy mm -hmm. adventures, and, like count that as part of like your year because it actually will pay off like in dividends um, subsequently. I think there's a couple of different ways you can really take it. One is to try and learn something actually, which I think you should treat with extreme, again, like respect and caution. Like if you want to really understand a subject, you can't just go and be like, all right, I did like 80 hours of a course. You have to be like every day for at least like two to three hours of real work and maybe like eight hours of like allocated time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to like fully ask questions about the subject and be intellectually engaged with it. And it is so hard to show up to that every day. Um, and, and I respect so much people that who do. But then I think lastly, it's kind of like pre-planning for it. It's so hard to like, kind of tell someone this and have them remember it. But like, you're going to start off, if you get traction, you'll go at a high. And then in the middle of the year, you're gonna experience a low or some kind of emotional feeling of like, what am I, like existentialism again. And to just keep kind of preparing for that, psychologically overcoming it and kind of like get back up and like keep going. I think just no one tells you how hard it is to like push something forward on your own, um, especially if you don't have momentum yet. And so just kind of like being okay if you're sad, being okay if it's like hard and just like keeping going um and, and trusting yourself that it'll work out okay and just like having fun you know when you can you feel like it's a good idea so it's like probably like a thousand different like random like points but i just yeah i feel like it's it's hard to convey how meaningful those years can be but also how hard they can be and how like that's okay if that makes sense so follow your instincts yes <laughs> is there Concisely is stated. there anything that um i guess like in terms of frameworks you'd offer or thoughts on sort of if people have multiple options of companies they should could work at during a gap year how, or, or someone who's graduating for the first time and trying to decide between opportunities, how should they think about where they should go? I would, so personally, I would, I would peg most of it to the rate of growth of the company mm -hmm. um, along most any metric that matters. And if they're equally growing, then I would peg it to the expertise of the leading person there in the field that you care about that you could possibly work with. I, I guess like, and you might have better context for this than I do. For many companies that might be like, um, a plateau of like flatness and then kind of like mm -hmm. a sudden like peak of like growth. And maybe what I was saying is like, should, if there's a difference in growth later, then like definitely join there. I, I think actually though I'd push back a bit that often if there's not a excellent best in class person in the early part, you're not likely to see the growth later. So that's, it's also heuristic that like you shouldn't join the company. Mm -hmm. Well, 
thinking more about biotech, like if someone were to come to you asking for investment and, you know, they're in high school, they're in college, uh, they don't have necessarily like the graduate degree that, or, or sort of the, the coursework done yet or the lab experience, like how does that impact your decision whether to invest? So I care a lot less about what someone's like, like people will send me pitches that like are technical in nature. I'm like, look, you're just too young. Like at your stage, unless you're like a total genius and blow it, which there are some people who are like that, like no undergrad project going to show me is going to impress me. Hmm. But if you have the maturity to understand that and recruit somebody who is far more technically talented than you to join you and respect them and understand how to work with them, that's very impressive. So I'm not saying like, don't be technical if you're young. Like, I think you can go down the path that's very impressive. I, think, I just think it takes more time to get there because you just have to like get more context for stuff and do more stuff to like become excellent. Um, mm -hmm. So you can do that quickly, but like it's just one. But I think I think something that people often forget is like, I like that it's obvious that they haven't had the time to do that, but if they can recruit that person and work with them in a way that like pushes the company forward, that's a very impressive thing in of itself. It bodes very well for the relationship going forward, right? I, I don't think yeah. I'm not saying like, don't be technical if you're young. I'm, I'm more saying like, there's a different way to be a founder technically when you're young that is still very impressive that I almost look for that signals kind of maturity that I think is hard to, um, Hard, hard, hard to get, but if you have yeah, what, I'm, like, what I'm hearing from you, if, if I'm understanding correctly, is kind of like it's not enough to be technical when you're young. You also have to show the ability to recruit senior people, and if someone can show that, then you're going to be interested in investing potentially. But if they're just yes, technical, and, that's going to be a very high bar. What well, and for your companies, what would you say is the importance of like an undergraduate or graduate degree in the sciences and especially biotech? Um, so I, it actually comes a lot into playing companies in terms of compensation. So I know a lot of biotech companies particularly peg like comp levels to whether you have a PhD or a postdoc. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think this is also an attract where like sometimes the CEO is just like, well, that person is just great. Just like give them a lot of money and like have them go do stuff, right? So like if you if you go into a company for the normal channels and like a recruiter is looking at your background and they're thinking of what to offer you, they'll probably give you something that's like somewhat tied to your experience. But I think often like if you are coming in and you're just like, Somehow you got the CEO to like get you on board. You like come and you do like random stuff for a couple of months. No one really knows why you're there. It's something like kind of like someone that's important. You have kind of like some reason for a title or like salary. Then I think often you'll get something that's like very out of range for your background, but just due to the fact that like you've made yourself obviously valuable. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I think it's still sometimes like recruiter will be like, oh, like, why is this person like like if they get paid this and like everyone who like you know just has an undergrad degree or doesn't have one like will think they should get paid more. So it's it's it's, it's an interesting balance of like. What everyone else perceives their like comp value to be and kind of like where, where, where you should be in a sense due to, due to yeah. merit well there's so there's comp value but there's also like can you just get a job in the first place so do you see impediments for people getting jobs in biotech without a degree um i mean i think the way that i look at it is there's kind of like the shadow network of people who like don't have degrees or don't care about them that like operates like in the background and then like so like through the normal like mode it's hard because if you apply for a job they'll look at your cv and be like before they even talk to you like did this person do x or y but I think probably like for each interesting company, there's at least one person there who like doesn't give a flip about that and like just wants mm -hmm. like really, really good people to work hard. And they know that you're undervalued. Like they, they know that if you don't have a degree and you are that good, like you will work with them because like you have to, but like, you know, they're lucky to get to work with you if you're really good. And so I, I think like there's there's usually a way through, through a person there that you'll find to, to get into the company if, if the mm -hmm. company is really good. Um, and I think, I think there, there, there's a, a large number though of biotech companies that are very hierarchical and very kind of like stayed um, and, and, and where that structure works for them. But I think for maybe like 50% of companies in biotech is like probably wouldn't work. But for 50%, I think that there's probably somebody there who like really would be amenable to working with you if you're young and excellent. Uh, you know, sort of two last questions. One is uh, if you were to go back to college tomorrow, uh, what were the classes that you'd want to take? Oh boy, uh, cosmology, <laughs> quantum mechanics, general relativity, special relativity, organic chemistry, biochemistry, um, stat, me stat mech, all the information theory courses, all like thermodynamics courses, uh, tragedy, um, literature, poetry, anything that involved Novikov, like I sold this anywhere, would be great, Shakespeare, like it just, yeah, I, it, it, there's a whole like litany. All, all the chemistry stuff that like I wish I'd like gotten better grounding in, yeah. Yep, and then what's one piece uh, of advice uh, out of everything in this conversation uh, or anything that's not mentioned that you would leave students with? Um, okay, this is going to sound like very woo-woo, but I think like if you're unhappy or scared or sad right now, it will get better. Like life is actually amazing in many ways, but like everyone who's in a great place now understands where you are now if you're not in a good place and struggling and like give your, like, like learn to love yourself, like be okay with like 
that things will, are not always all right. But yeah, just know that eventually, like if you're going through a hard, if, if, if you feel stressed, like things are hard, they're probably gonna work out okay. And a lot of people who are in like wonderful places right now have like a similar experience. So I know, I know that's not so really, like that's what I would say. I love it. Laura, thank you so much for joining today and for uh, lending your brain to us. <laughs> Thanks, Dylan. Always a pleasure. <laughs>